afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to School of Data. For our last session here at the main stage, I have the pleasure of introducing Derek Kravitz from Muckrock, um, who will pr be presenting the, an inside story from New York City's top data journalists. Um, we will have a Q&A session near the end, and when we do have the session, you can turn on your mic by pressing speak at your desks. But besides that, please keep your mics off and give it up for Derek. Hey, um, so for the Q&A part, I'll just start with this. Uh, we actually have a bit.ly and a QR code here on the screen. If you wanna go ahead and submit a question and or story ideas, things that you're interested in about New York City data journalism in particular, uh, we have an Airtable form that you can fill out. Uh, it'll go to all of us uh, here at the panel. So I'll also check the Airtable form in real time if you have questions. Uh, and then otherwise you can speak your questions. And I'll go ahead and start introducing everyone. Um, first off, I'll, I'll introduce myself. I'm Derek Kravitz. Uh, I'm with MuckRock. MuckRock is a FOIA portal. It's also a distributed remote newsroom. Uh, it also runs Document Cloud, which I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, and I've been working here in New York in, in journalism for about 20 years. And, uh, and I'll get to the panel here. Um, so I'll start with Max. Max Siegelbaum is the co-executive director and co-founder of Documented. Documented is New York's go-to source for immigration news. He began his career in post-revolution Egypt, reporting on politics and culture. His work for Documented led to the divestment of millions of public dollars from private prisons and contributed to policy changes in New York State. He has won awards from Deadline Club, the Edward R. Murrow Awards, and was nominated for a Livingston Award. He oversees all the editorial content for Documented. Bianca Pallaro is a senior investigative data reporter for the nonprofit newsroom, The City. She previously worked for USA Today and the Upshot team at the New York Times. Before moving to the United States to pursue her master's degree in data journalism at Columbia University, she worked for five years as a senior data reporter at La Nación in Buenos Aires, where she led international award-winning corruption investigations and crowdsourcing projects. She won an ONA award, two ONA awards, and the New York Press Club Award in 2022. Jacqueline Jeffrey, Jeffrey Walensky is a data journalist at WNYC and The Gothamist, where she reports on data-driven stories for radio and the web. She works quite a bit on public health, disability, and health disparity coverage, along with environmental, climate justice, and municipal technology beats. She got her master's at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, was a data reporter at Spectrum, which is an autism news outlet. She freelanced for NBC News, The Daily, news, Daily Beast, and Stat and More, and she volunteered with the COVID tracking project where she cleaned data and fi helped find reliable sources in state health departments. And then lastly, Jesse Coburn is Streets Blog's investigative reporter. He won just won the George Polk Award in 2024 for his investigative series on the black market for temporary license plates, which he'll describe more uh, in his slides. He was a reporter at Newsday and editor at Arch Plus, and he's written for the New York Times, the Baltimore Sun, Harper's Cabinet, Motherboard, and other outlets. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and very, very quickly describe Muckrock, Document Cloud, and a little bit about who we are just to give you some overview in case you wanna use some of our uh, websites. Muckrock is a nonprofit public records platform. It allows you to FOIA um, or submit FOIA requests across the country, not just New York State or New York City. It has about 22,000 agencies across the US. Document Cloud is an OCR tool. It essentially makes um, you know, static PDFs into machine-readable uh, data. Um, a lot of newsrooms use it in order to do a little snippet of a piece of a document and embed it into their CMS, into their content management systems. Makes it really easy to make a, a piece of a document sort of live a little bit brighter. Um, I'm gonna describe th very quickly three projects that we worked on that were data journalism that were nationwide. So th these are things that we share with local newsrooms like the city and the document and others, you know, in uh, this, and for this example, outside Chicago with the Cicero Independiente, which is a bilingual publication started in 2019. We installed our own purple air sensors on volunteers' homes in the small town of Cicero. We tracked air quality um, over the course of a year, looking at why that particular town, mostly about 90% Hispanic, 
has some of the worst air quality in the United States. What we found was because of an Amazon warehouse, uh, industrial pollution, uh, one of the busiest transit hubs for, for railways in the United States, um, all of those were contributing factors. Uh, we end up doing a lot of uh, visuals with this, a lot of illustrations, and the, the result was a lot of um, response from the company and uh, some of the local elected officials who um, didn't necessarily agree with some of our initial findings. Uh, Uncounted, which is a death certificate error project. We worked with a lot of local newsrooms trying to figure out why there was such an undercount of COVID deaths in particular parts of the country. We worked with a team out of the Boston University Global School of Public Health to track excess deaths and what we would expect to see in terms of mortality uh, in various counties across the country versus what we were actually seeing. What we found was COVID-19 was undercounted, especially in the Deep South and the Midwest. We tried to highlight some of those examples. Uh, in a recent example, we talked to a coroner out in Missouri who said that he just simply didn't do COVID deaths. He didn't believe in it, and he would not write COVID on the death certificate. 26 months later, he was uh, charged with three felonies and a, and a misdemeanor for lying on death certificates. Uh, the photo is of a suicide, actually, not a COVID case, but uh, there was a, a suicide note and a cocktail of, of drugs that the person took before they, they killed themselves. He listed that death as a heart attack. So just shows you sort of the real world implications of some of the work. And then lastly, smoke screened EPA wildfire data. This applies nationwide, especially in New York. There was an informal EPA policy started in the 80s that made, um, you could basically write off really bad wildfire events from federal data. Uh, the Canadian wildfires obviously happened last summer. It affected New York and, and the whole eastern seaboard. The result was a lot of excluded fires. So you'll see the little red dots are days that were removed from federal register data because these counties or these states decided we don't like how bad this data looks. We don't want it to influence our Clean Air Act compliance. Please remove it from the record. So these are, you know, again, examples that are national but then also connect locally that some of our panelists will describe. Um, so before I go uh, start with Documented and, and Max, I wanna ask one question for, for the panel, uh, then they'll go through slides for about five minutes each, and then we'll turn it over to you for Q&A. So the question I have for everyone is, you know, given the challenges facing news organizations, uh, you know, both, you know, small and large and different types of news organizations, what makes you excited about data journalism here in New York City and what keeps you up at night in terms of either the state of journalism or just the coverage areas that you're, you're reporting on? And we can start maybe with Bianca and then go across the table. Yes, okay. So basically it's all the possibilities that covering New York City has. So because you could actually dig deep into important issues to tell impactful stories in the public interest. And sometimes as a data reporter, that means like working on quick turn data projects, gathering, scraping data, but uncovering something that couldn't be possible if you didn't have those data skills. Another means and other times it actually means like working on long-term investigations, revealing abuse of power, violations of public trust, and actually driving real-world impacts, which is why I basically do journalism. And I guess what keeps me up at night is thinking that at some point, like only local New York City journalism can thrive th through the support of our readers and we need to make them understand that it's through their donations that we can actually do this job. So there are, Documented was founded in 2018, and in that time we've seen a lot of newsrooms uh, founded in New York City. And with this plethora of nonprofit and smaller kind of scrappy startups, there's a lot of room for collaboration. You know, we work with the city on a major project that I think Bianca is going to talk about. And it means that there's a lot of organizations out there who don't have the institutional baggage that some of the larger ones have and are really nimble and excited to work with each other. And I think it also brings less of a sense of competition and kind of 
you know, that aggression between uh, news organizations. I think the thing that keeps me up at night is obviously the financial state of the industry. It's really, um, you know, I started my career at a newspaper that was undergoing massive layoffs and it's been pretty steady across the country since then. It's in a really bad position. I think the bright side is that nonprofit news is growing and more and more people are seeing that as a place to give their money. But yeah, overall, it's a pretty bleak picture. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll start with what keeps me up at night so I can end on a positive note. I mean, it's, I think we're all gonna have similar answers to this, but uh, journalism's in a really precarious position right now. Um, and especially recently in the past few months, the sort of waves of layoffs feel like they've kind of passed the event horizon. Um, and, you know, I think we should all be very concerned about the industry contracting further. I think the downstream effects on democracy and society will be terrible. Um, and no one really has a good solution to it. I mean, places like Documented in the City, you know, offer reasons for hope. Um, but, uh, you know, there needs to be bigger fixes yet that we haven't quite figured out. Um, the thing that I think we can all feel good about, um, particularly about data journalism, is how ubiquitous it's become in journalism. Um, you know, there are, uh, you know, pretty much everyone is using data now. Um, and, you know, that includes reporters who have no special training in, in data analysis or anything like that. Um, and that's just because there's so much good quality data out there, and that's really a testament to the open data movement. Um, and I think that that has had positive impacts on uh, journalism and, you know, uh, benefits to our readers to, to sort of help us demystify government. I'm also going to start with the bad one. And you guys can all hear me, right? Yeah. Great. Um, so notwithstanding the absolutely desperate financial situation in which we find ourselves as journalists, uh, a couple of things that also keep me up at night that I think are in part consequences of that. Um, the first one is as, as the industry contracts and, and thinks more from like a scarcity mindset, my fear is that it's harder and harder to explain to decision makers and the people who uh, hold the keys to the coin purse, like why data journalism is worth the squeeze. And like, I know why it is, and you all know why it is, and, and many readers know why it is. Um, but because it takes, it, it oftentimes takes more time, uh, you have to iterate. Um, I just worry like that more and more we're gonna be in a spot where we have to like defend why it's useful. Um, and the other thing, it's not, not as much related to that, is um, the impermanence of so much of what we do. Like so often I go back to a, a data story with like, that, like, you know, five years ago that had like the most incredible data visualization and like the tool is deprecated and it's just gone or like it used flash or whatever. Like, and it happens so often. Um, and I definitely am, am haunted by that. Like the idea that like so much of like the crux of what we do is like, can be lost to the sands of time so easily. Um, although you could argue that just underscores why it's so important to uh, to ensure that like the text of our stories really contains the thrust of the message in that data because that will live on beyond tools. <clears throat> and then the thing that uh, makes me feel a little bit better is every time I talk to uh, a new aspiring data journalist, uh, many of whom, unlike me, like I didn't know this was a, a job until you know well into my adulthood, um, kids who are studying it while they're in college, who are doing dedicated data journalism graduate programs and who are, who are just coming out like so incredibly skilled in both data and journalism and like that sheer repository of talent makes me feel very positive, even if nothing else does. That's Great, it. thank you. Um, so we will start with documented and uh, just flag when you want slides changed. Okay, so uh, in case you all are not familiar with Documented, I just want to give a brief background. Founded in 2018, we cover New York City's immigrant communities. And we do that basically twofold. We cover news that is relevant to, to people affected by the immigration system and various issues within their communities. Uh, we do that in four different languages. English, Chinese, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. And we do that um, 
in a, in a way we try to be responsive to their needs rather than kind of coming in and kind of assuming what people want. So it's a lot of service journalism, but it's a lot of more traditional news and investigative reporting as well. Um, and in an effort to really reach people where we are, we publish on um, some unconventional platforms like WeChat for Chinese community, WhatsApp for Spanish speakers, and Nextdoor, um, which we found was a prevalent platform for New Yorkers of Caribbean origin. Um, so you can go to the next slide. But the project I'm talking about today was something that I started back in, I believe it was 2019. Um, and to get at that, I want to just talk about the origins. So on the left, you will see a building that is it's part of the organization in Port Chester, New York, called Don Bosco Workers. We were invited there. The co-founder of Documented and I were doing a listening tour going to various um, immigrant rights groups, trying to understand what issues that they were focused on. And again and again, they were saying our, our people, our constituents, were telling us that their wages were being stolen at job sites. So at one of these sessions, we met this guy named Gonzalo who had run this program it was where he was going around to businesses in Port Chester, and I think in Westchester generally, giving them a sticker that said they this business treats its workers well, basically, was the idea. And I thought that was interesting, so we, we made a connection and we went up there. And while we were there, he was sort of talking about what he does, and, and he's kind of an amateur, I mean, it's say professional investigator for wage theft cases. He helps um, day laborers file them against the people who steal their money. And he was pulling out papers from his desk, and he had this uh, notice from the Connecticut Department of Labor, which was uh, the affirmative wage theft claim against a worker from a tree trimming company. And the next year, he pulled out another slip of paper, and the, the tree trimmer had done the same thing. And, and the Connecticut uh, Department of Labor had also found he stole a different person's wages. So that got me thinking, you know, like what if the first person had known about, I mean, what if the second person had known about the first? Would that have changed anything? Um, would that have helped the public understand kind of who they were hiring to, to trim their trees? Would it have helped the worker to know, okay, this boss may steal my wages, I should protect myself? And that kind of set me off on this journey to try and find out in New York State, which businesses have been found guilty of stealing their workers' wages. And on the right side of the screen, you'll see a, a FOIL request that I made to the State Department of Labor. Um, and you'll also see a little filing notice at the top of it, which is why, because we had to sue them to get them to respond our, to our uh, FOIL request, and that took many years, and it's a different story entirely. But um, go to the next slide. What it resulted in is what you see on the screen, which is what we call our wage theft monitor. And you can go to nywagetheft.com, and it's a searchable map of every business that has been found guilty of wage theft in New York State by either the Federal Department of Labor or the State Department of Labor. And the point, you know, there are a lot of different ideas behind this, but one of them is for New Yorkers generally to be able to look at the businesses in their lives that may have stolen people's wages. So you can type in your zip code, which I encourage you to do. I mean, the, what I did for this is just where our office is. And um, you can see, you know, the things around you and the businesses, whether they're this is a sandwich shop that I used to go to. Um, I did not know they stole people's wages when I went there. And you know, you have all sorts of stuff. So it's really when we wanted to do a map because what we're hearing is that people don't always know exactly the you know the legal entity that's employing them. They might just know where the house was, where they worked at, or where the office is, or something like that. And we really want to give people a different way to interact with this data. Um, go to the next slide. 
So this was just an example from this past week. Grimaldi's Pizza, you know, there's this uh, growing movement of prosecutors who are taking this issue ser much more seriously and starting to um, really prosecute people for wage theft. And this was from just from the news, Grimaldi's Pizza, famous institution. Um, the Manhattan DA charged them with wage theft. They did the whole perp walk kind of shaming, got all the local news there to cover it. And when I was reading in, he had, um, you know, he had that quote from the top. He had texted this, he, he said this to a worker. He said, I've got three complaints on me and the state is not gonna do a thing. So I thought that was very illuminative of his mindset around this issue is just feels impervious to that. So I also was curious if we could find these three complaints. And I looked in the database and you know, they just came up immediately. So had those workers, um, and this is sort of a feature that hasn't been released yet, but it just shows you that like there is this whole kind of hidden history in these businesses and, and you can really find out a lot about how they're operating by just kind of browsing the data. And finally, um, next slide. We also, you know, we tried to use this in as many ways as we can. And we did a very detailed analysis. It was with a news outlet called ProPublica, where we did a very detailed analysis of this data. And we found that the majority of the wages, when the Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor, found that um, a business was guilty of wage theft, they are also tasked with retrieving the money from the business owner and then distributing it to the owner. And our analysis found that the majority of the dollars in that case were not being collected, so people were just um, never getting the money that was owed to them. So we published a story on that and just the data generally, and um, I think a few, I, I forget how much lighter, but um, the state senator introduced three bills based on that, which is very exciting and always nice when that happens. So that was a project I could keep talking, but I just wanted to put the various things on the screen. That's my email if you want to reach out in my X slash Twitter handle, and then our website as well as the Wage Theft Monitor's website. Thank you. And we'll hear next from Bianca at the city. Yeah, so at the city, we've been working for several months in partnership with Documented, uncovering clusters of show donations to Eric Adams' 2021 campaign and his 2025 re-election re campaign. So basically, I wanted to tell you a little bit how all of this started and why we started looking into this and tell you kind of the background story. So around July last year, Manhattan prosecutors indicted seven, six of Adams associates for conspiring to use this straw donor scheme to channel illicit matching funds to his 2021 mayoral campaign. So when that news broke, we, I sat down with my editor at the time and we were like, okay, what should we do, right? Should we just follow the case? Should we just try to see what happened, what methodology they used? And I remember he said something like, look, if there's one straw donor scheme, it, there might be others, right? That's the first instinct of uh, an investigative reporter. So he was like, you have one day to look into the campaign finance database and if you find something, let's talk about it. So I was like, great. So if you go to the next slide, I had like one day to basically clean all the campaign finance data. Anyone who has worked with campaign finance database knows that some columns are quite messy, like the employer's one, sometimes the addresses. So I cleaned all that up and tried to do some like geospatial analysis, like mapping the, mapping the donations, seeing if I could find like specific clusters. And of course, this wasn't like an exp exploratory analysis. This was mostly focused on trying to find straw donations. So instead of looking at like big donations from, yeah, some specific donors, I was looking at specific dates where a large number of donors contributed small amounts trying to copy the methodology that was found in the indictment. 
So it didn't take me that long to actually find this cluster of hundreds of 249 exactly donations. And for those that don't know, 249 is a very specific number because it's $1 away of the maximum amount to classify for the city's matching fund program that basically multiplies this amount times eight. So any donation with using public funds, so any donation that's $250 or less ends up being, uh, you multiply it by eight, so a $250 donation ends up being a $2,000 donation. So the fact that all these donations were 249 was kind of suspicious, right? They were all happening on similar dates. So we're like, okay, maybe this is it's worth looking into. Then we started looking at their employer and they all shared the same employer. The, all these donations were coming from people who were working at the New World Mall in Queens. And they all had Asian American names. So the first thing I do is, if you go to the next slide, I foiled for voter registration data. And I realized that none of them were registered to vote. So I was like, okay, it's worth looking into. Why? Because why would basically a cashier donate $249 to Adams and then not actually vote for him, right? So. And then I also foiled for the contribution cards to see the underlying records behind the data, that that's just a good practice. And what we found out at, is, was that they all shared similar handwriting. So I was like, okay, another thing, a red flag. I talked to experts and they were telling me, okay, this is something you should look into, but also try to see the payment method they were, they were using. And some of them were using money orders, which is a really hard to trace type of payment method, which was another red flag. And then, yeah, it was also foiling for expenditure receipts, which is basically, the expenditure database is public, but you can actually foil for the receipts, like the original ones. And I saw that Eric Adams held like eight fundraising events at the Royal Queen restaurant that's located at the New World Mall. So all of these things kept popping up and we started looking, if you go to the next. So one thing that's important is that when you start talking to people and to experts, you find out that there's data that might not be public, that the Campaign Finance Board doesn't actually publish, but they have it, right? So I started hearing about this fundraising reports where basically you have every fundraiser that campaigns held and all the donations attached to them. So I foiled for that. I got the foil back. I saw that the owner of the mall also held two fundraisers at his place for Eric Adams. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. We should keep looking into. And then I also foiled for intermediary reports. These are just examples of things you can actually foil for at the campaign finance board and that are not public, but they have that data. If you go to see. So we end up publishing this story, but of course data, I think it's important to point out that it's not enough. Like what actually broke the story was going door knocking with April from Documented, Documented who actually speaks Mandarin. So b basically one thing is finding a suspicious cluster of potential straw donations and the other thing is actually confirming that these were straw donors, meaning that they got reimbursed. So that's when we went actually talked to all of these people and some of them confessed that they got reimbursed by their bosses, their mall owners. Some of them said that their signatures were forged, that that was not their signatures because we had the original records. And like a dozen said that they donated at the behest or with the encouragement of the mall owners, which of course raises the question of potential coercion, right? So yeah, the, this is just the first story that we published, but I thought it was nice to tell you a little bit about the background story. And we'll hear next from Jesse with Streets Block. So um, Streets Blog covers transportation issues in the city with a focus on the negative effects of car dependency and efforts to reclaim urban space for mass transit users, pedestrians, and cyclists. Um, I use a lot of data in my work, and so I'm going to give a few examples from the past few years. Next slide, please. So first I'll talk about the Ghost Tags project. Um, this was an investigation into the black market for temporary license plates in the city. 
Temporary license plates are those paper tags that you get from car dealerships after buying a car. That's the only legal way to have them on your car. But what I found was that during the pandemic, New Yorkers started opening basically sham used car dealerships in states with loose regulations, gaining access to government systems for generating temp tags, printing tons of them and selling them illegally on the black market. And their buyers were people with suspended driver's licenses, no car insurance, or other more nefarious reasons to want anonymity on the road. Um, and data was foundational to these findings. Um, through public records requests, I eventually obtained data on 4 million temp tags issued by 10,000 used car dealers in two states, New Jersey and Georgia, whose temp tags were very common in New York City. And this data led to two key findings. First, that no name dealerships were issuing thousands, even tens of thousands of temp tags each year while displaying no other discernible business activity. Um, second, that many such dealerships were registered to the same strange warehouses and office buildings across those states that looked nothing like a place to buy a car, but each served as the official business address of dozens or even hundreds of dubious car dealerships. And it turns out a lot of those businesses were selling temp tags illegally. So that was fairly simple data work, just combining data sets, sorting, filtering, pivot table, stuff like that. Um, a much heavier lift data-wise was an investigation called Always Scared. Um, so this was a deep dive into traffic violence outside of New York City public schools. Um, student drop-off and pickup at city schools seemed to us to be chaotic and maybe dangerous from a traffic safety perspective. Uh, but we wanted to find out if that was borne out in the numbers. So to answer that, I used Postgres to join dozens of open data sets and data sources made public by the city and built this kind of Frankenstein database that listed every car crash in the city since July of 2015. It was, I think, about a million crashes. Uh, and whether that crash happened near a New York City public school. And if it did, whether it happened on a school day, whether it happened during the hours where kids were arriving in the morning and leaving in the afternoon, and the enrollment and demographics of that school. And then analyzed that database, and what it showed was that school streets were, in fact, more dangerous than non-school streets. Uh, they have higher rates of car crashes and injuries on school days. By contrast, there's no difference in those rates on non-school days. Um, and this danger was greatest precisely during the times when kids were arriving in the morning and leaving in the afternoon. We also discovered a race and class disparity to the issue. Um, streets outside of school, buildings with majority students of color or majority poor students had far higher crash and injury rates than streets outside of school buildings with majority white or affluent students. Um, just to close, I'll talk about one story I did using the city's 311 data, which we use frequently. Um, so this story stemmed from a common reader complaint we received, uh, namely that the NYPD doesn't take 311 complaints about driver misconduct seriously. We wanted to see if we could prove that in the data, so I decided to look at the number of complaints that the NYPD closes in under five minutes. By contrast, it takes uh, police seven and a half minutes on average to respond to even critical emergencies, according to the department. So it seemed improbable that officers would be responding even faster to reports of like blocked bike lanes or a chronically ignored stop sign. Um, so I analyzed the city's 311 open data set in Postgres. And what I found was that the percentage of 311 complaints about driver misconduct that the NYPD was closing in under five minutes uh, had shot up during the pandemic that the problem was particularly acute in certain police precincts, and that officers appeared to be lying about responding to complaints when in fact they hadn't. Um, to close, I'll just say that all of this data work only served as the beginning of these stories. There's still a lot more traditional reporting that followed to kind of enliven the numbers and show what they meant in the lives of real people, but data was the foundation, and these stories wouldn't have been possible without it. Thank you. And last but not least, we'll hear from uh, Jacqueline from WNYC Gothamist. Hello again. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, so I feel like the everything we just heard, especially the last one, was a great testament to the power of, of open data. And we really do have such a wealth of publicly available city, state, federal, and other data sets. Um, but I thought this might be a fun opportunity to talk about a different type of data, um, data that is ostensibly available, right? Maybe it's posted on a government website. Um, but for whatever reason, it's just not the kind that you can easily download, analyze, and 
use as a foundation for reporting. Maybe it's pre-digested in a map, like a, a map of COVID cases in New York City schools. Um, maybe it's a, a picture. I've seen some where they just post like a picture of data, which is absolutely the worst case. Uh, but <laughs> one time someone sent me a screenshot of an Excel spreadsheet that was on a transparent background, uh, <laughs> like the checkered background. That was probably the worst case. Um, but so, you know, sometimes it's in a PDF, right? Like in the, in the early days of COVID, many um, municipalities would publish PDFs with cases, which obviously like isn't the easiest, but thankfully there are great tools like Document Cloud. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can build this like fabulous pipeline that downloads all of these reports for you. Um, other times you're on a deadline and you just need to like get in, get the data and get out. Um, so I wanted to talk about some dirty tricks uh, that I use in those instances. First one is lazy scraping. Uh, sometimes you build a beautiful scraper, you use beautiful soup and um, get everything you need. Other times you need to write a quick story um, about uh, New York State immigration judges and how they compare to other states' judges in terms of their decisions. Uh, there's a fabulous resource for immigration data uh, nationwide, it's called TRAC, um, and they, they FOIL on a regular basis for immigration data and publish it online. As you can maybe tell from this website, they've been doing it for a very long time, like since the 90s. Um, and they say they have an API in progress, but it is not yet available. Um, so oftentimes, the only way to get the data is to either try and copy and paste it, which we all know does not tend to go very well, um, or to just do a little lazy scraping. Um, so I actually did uh, the scraping for this entirely in Google Sheets. It was one simple command, uh, import HTML, to grab the table. That is like such a superpower. If there is a table, in most cases, you can simply do import HTML. There are limits, like if, if there are a lot of, like I think there's only a certain number of these types of commands you can do per day. Um, but there's a whole suite. There's import HTML, import XML, uh, and a couple others as well, and I rely on them very often. And then you can also, if you really want to, you can supercharge this with Google Apps Script, uh, but I'm, I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, in this presentation because we are talking about lazy, dirty tricks. Uh, all right, next slide. Uh, <laughs> next one is sneaky APIs. Um, so you'll see here um, in this slide, there's a picture of a map. It's from the National Weather Service depicting, uh, I think it's current like maximum wind gusts or something. When I took the screenshot, there weren't many crazy wind gusts. Um, but during some of the, the crazy rain and windstorms we had um, in the last couple of months, some of these wind gusts were reaching really dramatic levels um, to the point where we kind of wanted to have some sort of like live storm tracker on our website that people could check and see what was happening in their area. And that would also guide our own field reporting. If we wanted to send someone out in the aftermath of the storm to the areas that were hit the hardest, it was really helpful to have this National Weather Service data uh, showing which parts of the city had the highest rainfall totals and the highest wind gusts. The problem is uh, the and National Weather Service, they, they share this data, but it's not in a form that's very easily accessible. Um, thankfully, if you're uh, down to do some dirty tricks, all you have to do is click into the developer tools in Chrome, um, switch over to your uh, fetch at XHR tab, refresh it, and you'll see a, a whole long list of every single call that is made in the course of the website to some database somewhere. Uh, and if you are willing to invest enough time and click through all of them, eventually you'll find the one that makes the map, which includes coordinates and the name of the station and the wind gusts and like all this other stuff. From there, it's simply a matter of grabbing that data through whatever method you prefer uh, and displaying it. And that's how we got live updating rainfall and wind gust maps uh, in a newsroom with one, one data journalist. <laughs> so it's a really useful tool for punching above your weight. Uh, that's the best thing about dirty tricks. <laughs> and then th th this is just, I, I just had to reserve a space for like the really cursed techniques. Um, so these campaign finance summaries, I don't know if this actually resulted in a story, but a colleague of mine sent me this, who's very skilled in data, um, sent me this website, this, these campaign finance summaries, and said, I'm doing everything I can, I'm using all the scraping tools at my disposal, but like I can't, it's just not coming out right. Um, you can see sort of in the top right of the slide, like what it looked like, like, like the, the rows and columns, something about them, they were not transmitting correctly. Um, a little bit of digging into the, the way the site was built showed that 
someone had made truly a, a, a deranged table uh, where like every cell on the table was like its own div. And so it, like, it was just, there was no way to scrape it in the usual way. Import HTML did not work here. Um, <laughs> what did work was going into the HTML, changing the size of this little display window. It was like a scrolling window, making it like 2,000 pixels long so that it displayed the entire table in one go, downloading that to a PDF, and then putting the PDF into tabula, uh, which takes PDF data and turns it into a spreadsheet. Uh, and those are some of the... Uh, <laughs> And you know, uh, uh, open data is is improving every day. We have like loads of uh, you know publicly available data sets. But don't let that stop you if it's not available uh, in the usual way. Uh, and so I encourage you to go forth and uh, use dirty tricks to get the data you need. Thanks. And uh, we have one question submitted uh, I want to get to. Um, also, I'll just flag that on our, um, in the schedule, in the program, under our panel, we have an, the Airtable form and a GitHub repo with all the slides available. So feel free to grab those there. The question comes from uh, Eliza um, from Amnesty International. What do, all, what do you all see as the future of the media industry? This is a very big picture question, um, which seems to be actively cratering, particularly around public interest reporting. <laughs> so I'll leave this open to anyone who wants to answer it. Very bad. <laughs> if you have the answer, I want to hear it. <laughs> I mean, I guess the question is like, what's likely to happen or what do we want to happen? I think if it's... You, you, I'll let you interpret. <laughs> yeah. I think if it's what's likely to happen is you'll continue to see places like the New York Times sort of like strengthen um, and fortify themselves and um, then you'll have this proliferation of like great small nonprofit news outlets but then everything in the middle, I think, is in trouble. You know, like mid-sized papers, regional papers, local papers, any, anything on paper is in trouble, I would say. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And I think that um, one of the major problems that we will face soon is the AI in search, because we get most of our web traffic from search. And AI is probably going to completely destroy that. So the way that people are talking about kind of counteracting that is ensuring that news organizations are kind of more fragmented. So you have a, uh, kind of a different approach where instead of measuring page views, you're measuring engagement and you're, you're publishing on more platforms, uh, interacting with people one-on-one. -on -one sort of in the way that we all get our information from different WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups, kind of going there and bringing them the information. I don't know if that will help the business model, but in terms of kind of disseminating news, that's the way we're thinking about it. And uh, this is the FAQ portion uh, of our panel. So uh, the microphone at your seat should work. Um, I think there's a speak button on it or you can raise your hand, whatever works. Yep, I see one there. Hi, um, I just wanted to first say thank you um, for the reporting you've done. It's really amazing. I feel grateful as a citizen um, that you guys are doing this. Um, also, hi, my name is Jasmine. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. One, um, how do you generate your ideas for stories? And then my other question is, it seems like basically everything you talked about took a lot of kind of work and digging and tenacity. And I'm curious, like, kind of what percent don't really make it that far? And at what point you're like, okay, this seems like a cool idea, but actually it's not really going anywhere and it's not really worth the lift at this point. For that last one, like so many, there are so many like like half tested ideas and things that just end up on the cutting room floor. Um, after that like Chabad tunnel story broke, like I spent, probably way longer than I should have trying to figure out how to like scrape every uh, DOB complaint in the uh, building information system that had the word tunnel in it. Uh, we did get it to work, but like th there was nothing really meaningful in it. But the good news is that sometimes those half-baked ideas end up serving you in other ways. So like now I, I have the foundations of a, 
a DOB complaint scraper. So if God forbid there's like a building collapse or some other, um, you know, cataclysmic event and we want to systematize it and like advance the reporting, we have that groundwork laid. So all the time, but it often ends up paying, paying off in unexpected ways. And next question, and it, a good idea, just let us know who you are and if you're directing the question to the full panel or a particular person, yep. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Vianney. This is for, for Jacqueline, actually, just piggybacking off what you said. Is there a way, once you've done all this, um, you know, wonderful work, challenging work and getting data in a good place, reporting on it, you know, you want the, the future of that data, you know, to, to you know, to, to be more permanent. Is there a central repo or is, are there projects trying to make that like more of a, you know, perennial data set for future use? Like wh where does it go? That's a great question. And I feel like um, organizations that think deeply about it, uh, unlike mine probably, <laughs> um, have have better answers than I do. Like I know there are newsrooms that have fabulous GitHub repos and and have invested the time and effort into creating something that the public can use that's like readily accessible to the public um, and that will endure. Um, but it's definitely a challenge. Thank you. Yep, we're here. <laughs> My bad. Um, I'm Hannah Gabrielle. This is a question for the whole panel. So there has been a lot of discussion about AI potentially um, taking people's jobs. Um, so I was wondering how would like data journalism, um, how would it be affected with the rise of like generated AI and um, and what are some steps that like data journalists could do to push back against like, you know, things like um, AI, like chat GPT or like um, Bing AI t to take, to not take your jobs, for example. Yeah, I think the idea is to use AI to empower journalism. Like in my newsroom, actually, there's a data reporter in my team who grabbed every article that the city had written in the past since its beginning. And she did an analysis to kind of figure out what areas in New York City we were not covering and what areas in New York City we were constantly talking about. So we published this big map Thanks to AI, she used ChatGPT to kind of figure out from each article, yeah, what neighborhood, what borough, and specifically the Lat Long that we were talking about. And you could see like AI holding us accountable in our own reporting. So that's a way to empower journalism too. Yeah, I'm a, a big fan of, of of using it to up your game. I mean, I, I use it all the time, even in like very scrappy like. I know that I know there's like this line of code that can do something, but I don't know how to do it. Let's like sit with ChatGPT and figure it out. Um, but as, as well as like just using it. And at the end of the day, at least so far, not yet. Uh, <laughs> ChatGPT can't go out and knock on doors. Uh, and of course, it's 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 based on everything that it's trained on, right? So like, um, it's always going to be a little bit stereotyped. Um, and I mean, human thinking is also going to be stereotyped, to be fair, but. Um, I like to think that we can have ideas and ask questions that uh, maybe aren't yet achievable by AI. I'm going to look at the left side of the room and see, yep, right there, pink shirt. Hi, uh, my name is Finn, and I was just wondering um, how, and this is for anyone on the panel, um, just what sort of balancing act is there between um, trying to engage in say more like cooperative collaborative relationships with uh, government agencies versus times where one you might just be in a more adversarial position based on what you're reporting on or where you you know have to act in a more adversarial manner such as have to sue them to make them cooperate um, just wondering how you try to thread that needle yeah i would say we have never really had a cooperative <laughs> relationship with a government agency. It's not that we don't, we have opposing missions. It just, it's never, we've never really been approached or kind of collaborate in, in any ways. I think my work is informed by 
relationships with uh, people that I've met who work for the city government and can kind of provide some information or just feedback, but it's never sort of like we're working together. Yep, another question there. Yep. Um, hey, my name's Tyler. Uh, this is for, for anybody. Um, it's, it's great to see, you know, how you guys get the data when you don't have, um, you know, easily usable APIs or open data sets to access the data. Um, but I'm curious if there are examples of agencies at, you know, local, state, or federal level that are kind of the opposite end that are really like, you know, killing it, like you find the data and you are able to get at it exactly how you want and, you know, wish other agencies were, were kind of like taking their lead. I mean, you know, for all that I've just belly ached about uh, inaccessible data sets, like New York City open data is the best. It's so great. Like you can find almost anything. You can do in incredible in deep investigative work just with publicly available data. And I'm always impressed with the data dictionaries. Like that, <laughs> that the fact that every data set on open data usually has a data dictionary puts it head and shoulders above most things that you'll find on the internet, I would say. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, overall, New York City is doing a good job, especially with the limited resources on their on, on their open data team. The MTA publishes so much data, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty That's useful. A good one. Yeah. Yep, in the back. Hi, I'm Emily, um, and I think this goes to the full panel and gets to kind of question like a lot of things have been brought up, but uh, open data is great and there's so many things that are accessible, um, but there are data sources that are suspiciously not publicly accessible or readable, which I think Jacqueline, um, you got to in your point. And one of the data sets that I'm dealing with is budget data um, and the OMB's Budget data is incredibly hard to parse. Um, one, <laughs> have you? How do you influence that? How do you get our government to be transparent in the right way so that we can make informed analysis? And two, if you have any tricks for dealing with that, I would I would love to know. <laughs> I mean, I think journalists have an advantage in dealing with this because we have a big, you know, microphone that we can. Uh, complain into. So I've written stories when government agencies have, you know, done like ludicrous stuff in response to FOIL requests, when agencies have charged me a lot of us a lot of money for to fulfill FOIL requests for data. Like I will note that in the story because I think it's outrageous. But, you know, I mean, for if you don't, if you're not a journalist, I don't really know what you can do other than just like be really annoying and email someone every day. There are a decent amount of freedom of speech lawyers and, and people who are interested in transparency. We've worked with the Cornell University First Amendment Clinic, who are really experts in FOIL law. And I've worked with others in DC. So there's, they will often work pro bono, or um, they kind of sue for lawyers' fees, and how they make, that's how they make their money. So there's just like a network of lawyers who I've found really helpful in not only the kind of litigation and, and the legal stuff, but also like sometimes the, the FOIL office won't respond to a journalist, but they will respond to a lawyer because they have to. And there's all this like interpersonal stuff that goes into getting data and information that they're really much better suited to do. One quick plug there. Um, we have a team of students out of Columbia that are working on an OCA project uh, looking at um, housing court judges. They can't get, they can get the courtroom numbers. They can't get, uh, match the court, the judge to the courtroom number because they change rooms so often. Um, so they're relying on Just Fix and a ton of other uh, nonprofits in the city to help them um, clean that data and, and, and supply that information for them. So there are nonprofit routes, essentially, to uh, helping you on your, on your data quest. Um, more questions? I see one right here in the middle. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I have a question along the same lines, the last two questions uh, for Bianca. So you mentioned how the campaign finance data that's available is just really messy. And I was just wondering if you have any ideas on how that data could be better structured or any additional data that could be made publicly available that it would make it easier for data journalists to do investigative work like the work you've done. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand how that data is collected. And for example, the first thing I did is actually complain to Campaign Finance Board, and I was like, there's so many missing cells. And their response was like, well, because they never provided the data. So understanding that always behind the data set, there's an underlying paper record. So at the end of the day, I ended up like requesting all the actual original contribution cards to understand like, okay, this is how a money order looks like. Or if there's a missing cell, I'm like actually ask, looking at the contribution card and seeing like, oh, okay, they just forgot to upload the address. So like I look, go in and search for the original record basically. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's a good point because you always have to understand like who's the one that needs to be held accountable is it in this case the campaign for not providing the campaign finance board the data or is it the campaign finance board not uploading the data to the data set? I think we have time for about three more questions, but um, if you want to submit questions uh, for after the fact, um, please go there and we'll make sure that everyone gets them. I'll just look at the right hand side here, question here. Yep. Hi, um, my name is Heba. This question is for everyone. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation. It's very interesting. And I'm actually taking a data journalism class right now. Um, I'm a librarian and I work at a university. I'd love to know how like, people like myself can collaborate with journalists to do more of this work. I used to work in public libraries and I understand the scrappy mentality of stubbornness and just like the computer will do this. But I also know that not everybody has the patience or just like I get sheer hard headedness to do that. So I wanted to know like what are ways that you would like to see that kind of collaboration um, so that everyone's skill sets are being valued and honored and it's not like people being steamrolled over and saying, oh, you're just a journalist, you don't know data. Um, and like to kind of comment on the earlier question, um, in terms of like storing and managing data, it's a huge question that libraries are asking right now. Um, so I, again, I just wonder like, what, what would you like to see in terms of collaborations and have there been any academic collaborations that you've been a part of that also included um, like a data management plan or making the data publicly accessible? I'm like almost embarrassed that I've never thought about it before, but like the library science skill set and the data, like that could be so powerful, like, the, like, like almost too powerful if they were to combine forces. <laughs> um, I don't have any good examples off the top of my head of like a really exemplary collaboration like what you describe. I've been lucky enough to work with some many talented professors and academics who like will help with advising on how we should analyze the data or bulletproofing the analysis. But in terms of like that after the fact, the only example I can really think of in my experience is, you know, working at WMYC, it's like a hundred year old public radio station. We have a fabulous archives department exquisitely organized, uh, transcribed and annotated. And I, I, I work with them all the time. If I'm doing a story about, I don't know, like, uh, I mean, like, like the classic one is that like every Thanksgiving we replay this clip of Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia talking about everything that you can do with your leftover turkey parts. Um, but I, I love uh, talking to them and, and they really think very deeply all the time about what happens after the radio, like what, what happens after the live conversation and they take care of that. And so I would love to foster more collaboration like that. And we might be able to end on this one question that just came in and then uh, again, feel free to uh, write us and we'll respond back. Um, Sarab at the New York City Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity 
probably a question that each panelist could um, briefly tackle. Looking back on stories you published that got government officials to take some type of action, were there any key elements of those stories or your reporting process that led to those actions? And we can start with Bianca. Yeah, I guess one of the stories that kind of drove real world impact was uh, when we analyzed all of the New York City contracts and we were looking, f trying to find red flags, meaning like those that have no bid contracts, like emergency contracts, sole source contracts, negotiated acquisitions. And we bumped into this big New York City Department of Corrections contract that was transferring commissary operations in Rikers Island to a company that was embroiled in controversies going back years, like two bribery scandals and dozens of late, dozens of lawsuits nationwide for gouging the incarcerated. And we did this data analysis where we got the commissary prices, we saw that they were gouging the incarcerated, we compared them to the prices in, at the gl closest grocery store to Rikers, and we saw, we, we basically exposed the, all the delivery issues that it, different inmates were having at Rikers, and eventually that led to the Department of Corrections added new stipulations to their contracts, like setting price limits, adding a help desk to help the inmates with all the delivery problems that they were having. And But you know what's important with this story is that you don't always have to believe what they're saying, because they said that they were adding these new stipulations to their contracts, and they did, but the problems were still there, and they were actually planning to renew this contract for three years. and. Eventually, the controller's office rejected the contract. So right now, the renewal is not going to happen. And he cited our reporting. So that's kind of cool. So we got the Time's Up um, placard. So that will do it. But please feel free to, to write us. Again, thank you for uh, showing up and asking great questions. And thank you to, to our panelists.